Okay, guys, today we have uh, Megan from GS1 back again, uh, mostly based on your guys' questions. So we've been getting a lot of questions lately all about GS1, uh, probably because a lot of you have been actually brand registering. Uh, so we thought it'd be a great opportunity to bring Megan back in, and uh, she's always happy to talk to the Amazon community. Absolutely. How you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, Megan. So remind us uh, what we talked about during the last video. Absolutely. So during our last video, we talked a lot about all of the basics of GS1 standards, the kind of 10,000 foot view on everything you need to know to get your business started, get launched on Amazon, and uh, get get make the, the right first steps. Yeah, I think what was super popular on our side was the, remember the t-shirt example that we I showed? Do. That yes. was very popular um, throughout the video. So guys, we can actually see in videos like what's popular, like what you guys are replaying the most. So uh, we'll actually link that video down below so you guys can check that out. Uh, that was a really good way of explaining GTINs in general. And I think a lot of people got value off of that. So thank you for that. Absolutely. And I, you know that example, we really talk about what variations within your products are actually going to require unique GTINs. And it comes up a lot in our environment as well, Patrick. So a lot of people asking, trying to understand how many products they actually have that might need a GTIN. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we get a lot. We get a lot. Uh, do they have to change their GTIN if they change their product? Yes, this is a big one. <laughs> so what do they do? So in within the GS1 standards, there's actually three guiding principles to help you understand if a product change you're considering might require a new GTIN. So there's three things to think about. First of all, the recipient of the product. Second of all, regulatory requirements. And third, the supply chain. And your supply chain means all the steps in line from getting the product from the factory floor to your customers. So we can go into those a little bit more. If you think about that first one, recipient, that could be your end customer, but it could also be your supply chain partners that are receiving your product first. So that might be if you're selling in a brick and mortar store, that person, it might be FBA. But you have to think about whether that customer or that first recipient will have to change their expectations of your product. The second piece, regulatory, are there regulatory changes or liability concerns that might require a new G10? And third, supply chain. If your product is going to change in weight, dimension, how it's stored, all of those things will affect your supply chain partners. They might need different equipment to lift your product. They might need more space to store it in. It might need to go in a slightly different temperature warehouse or things like that. Mm -hmm. So you have to be cognizant of that. And if that's the case, you're probably going to need a new GTIN. Okay. Yeah, we get it a lot where they'll just basically make some minor changes to the listing, right? So, so you guys know, if you guys have like a minor listing change, it's more of an Amazon issue than, um, than a GS1 issue, right? So let's just say you make a small product improvement, um, small product improvement. And what I mean by this is maybe you're just changing one image in the listing. It's like a good rule of thumb to show that product improvement, whatever that may be. That's okay. But if you're trying to completely change the product, you shouldn't do that because you're essentially, uh, it's against Amazon's terms of service. You will get caught eventually. Uh, and now it's just not proper or appropriate in the system, right? So the way you want to look at it is if someone were to return an old product, how different would that old product be? Or would you be willing to replace that old product with a new product? Is it basically the same at the same level? So that's kind of a good way to look at it. So what I just said is essentially a recommendation of what Amazon requires. And if you completely break the rules of what they could potentially do to you through their terms of service. But realistically, is this a requirement as far as GS1 standards go or? It's a really good question, Patrick. So GS1 standards are voluntary. They are not mandatory. <laughs> But it is really important to understand what your trading partners want from you as well, because they're going to have different expectations. Amazon has expectations, as will any other marketplaces you work with or retailers you work with. So as a brand, there are standard rules that you can apply when considering if you need a new G10. But we really recommend that anybody also check with their supply chain partners and their trading partners to ensure there's not a requirement they have uh, that that you know that you as a brand need to make sure you're in compliance mm -hmm. with as well okay yeah guys if you guys have any questions about that please uh start the conversation in the comments um as far as amazon goes we'll be happy to answer those questions and for a limited time depending on when you're watching this video i'm pretty sure gs1 will jump in and help us out in the comments as well if you have any more specific questions
Absolutely. And we do have a decision tool on our GS1 global website, which is gs1.org. And that could be a good place to start if, if you're really unsure what to do, go to that decision tool and it'll help you talk through what your try what change you're making to your product to see if it's gonna require a new GTIN. Okay. We'll link uh, we'll link that one down below as well, guys, so you guys can check out the decision tool. So Patrick, we really thought it'd be fun because questions like this come up a lot. Uh, to throw you a couple of mock scenarios and you can take a guess about whether those would require a new GTIN. What do you think? Sounds like a great idea, guys. Now you guys get to see how much I break the rules. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So now we're recording this video in April, but retail is all about Q4. Mm -hmm. So let's start with a holiday example. A cookie brand wants to add a Santa hat to their logo on their packaging. What do you think? As in what? Would do they need to would, change anything? Yeah, would they need a new G10? Would, would I do it? <laughs> No, I wouldn't change it. Well, so the answer to that one is actually a trick question. The answer is yes and no. <laughs> it's here. So no, you wouldn't need a new G10 for the product itself. The formulation is the cookie is not changing. The box of the cookies come in is mm -hmm. going to be a different weight or measure. But you would need a new G10 for your cases, meaning you need a way to distinguish a case of the holiday cookies from a case of the regular cookies. Because think if you're sending them to a grocery store, they need to be able to manage which of these in the palette are, are holiday versus regular so they can put them out at the right time and put them on sale if they need to. Mm -hmm. So for the Amazon audience, the listing wouldn't need to, you wouldn't need a new G10 on the listing, but your case packs might. I could see that. I mean, we actually, it's funny you bring up cookies. I won't say the brand, but it's, some, it's, a, it's a brand we actually represent and it's exactly what we did during the holiday. So we did some Christmas packaging. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't straight up called out as Christmas packaging. It's just, it's, it's essentially a sleeve that goes over the packaging. So it's really yeah. simple. Uh, guys, let us know if you guys want to see a video about packaging and, and how we, we package different stuff because we have some really creative ways that we go about it to really, you know, elevate a brand without spending too much money. And we just changed the color to red. And it was good, but and it was also good because they didn't all sell in mm -hmm. the holidays. So we had some left. <laughs> so it wasn't like a big deal. We didn't actually have right. to go ahead and pull the stuff. But yeah, okay. So I see how that's kind of a trick. So um, not super important for Amazon necessarily as long as the formulation and the actual product in the box isn't changed. Right. Um, even more important if the package is actually in the photo, I think right. for Amazon, right? But the thing is too, is like, you're probably gonna have the packaging in the photo anyway, if you're just changing the packaging for the hot. So yeah, it makes sense. Okay, I'm cool with that. Yeah. All right, sounds good. So I was kind of wrong, but not really. <laughs> okay, next. A dog food company wants to change from cans to biodegradable pouches, but I need a new G10. Ah, uh, yeah. I would say, yeah, because the weight of everything is basically changed. So it's everything's going to be different. That's yeah? correct. That's correct. Yep. The, the weight of the product is going to change. Possibly how you need to store it mm -hmm. may change. And the consumer expectation is going to change. So if they're ordering what they think are cans of dog food and yeah. they get pouches, they may not be happy. <laughs> we actually, uh, we saw that happen with, uh, I won't give details, but we have a client who also does wholesale through their account. Mm -hmm. And they were selling a certain product that was either going to come in a canister or like a bag. So we'll say it was flour, for example, right? And it was selling really well, but someone just made a mistake. They they listed it wrong. Mm -hmm. And maybe they uploaded the wrong image or they were sitting under the wrong listing, whatever they were doing. And the amount of complaints that they got against the account was insane. Yeah. Absolutely insane. Like people like pay attention to that, how it's supposed to come. Absolutely. Right? And even on the customer side, right? Maybe they're expecting the store a certain way, like what you said, either in a can right. or a pouch, right? So maybe, you know, maybe they're bringing it with them for travel and they want this pouch instead of a right. can and now you, you basically switch it on them, which isn't, which isn't cool. Okay, right. yeah, that makes sense, all right. Got one right there. <laughs> okay, so got a lot of great new self self-care product brands coming out, doing all sorts of new innovative things, mm -hmm. constantly evolving and changing to uh, meet the expectations of their customers. So first one. Um, a makeup company wants to save the orangutans. They want to take palm oil out of their product. Do they need a new G10? Yeah, because the formulation is changing. Correct. All yes. Right. Formulation is changing. It may need to be stored differently. It may appeal to new consumers, or there may be some consumers that can't use the the uh, the uh, replaced ingredient. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it would need a new G10. Wow. Okay. Straight forward. That makes on sense. That Just keep that in mind, guys. <laughs> I know a lot of you guys out there are doing makeup and things like that, so it doesn't take much. Uh, with those kinds of products, especially uh, to have to change it. Absolutely. Okay. You this... know, we see the same thing with supplements. 
Oh yeah? Yeah, because sometimes it'll like slightly change and then everybody breaks the rules and nobody talks about it. But then a great way to get somebody else shut down because people don't play by the, well, people are nasty to each other on Amazon. They'll just report each other. Yeah. So it's just like, you know, it's like a self-reporting system. <laughs> they throw each other under the bus. So I'm not a huge fan of supplements in general. Mm -hmm. All right, so this next one, also for personal care. I had to switch my packaging supplier and now my skin serum bottle is 5% smaller. Yeah, okay. So do I need a new G10? The bottle smaller or? Yeah, yeah, you should, yeah. I would. So no? the answer is maybe. Wow. And I'll give you the, I'm give the rule somebody. breaker here and I'm being too sensitive to this. <laughs> right. I see how it is, okay. So generally, if you change the volume of your packaging, your packaging only, and it's less than a 20% change, you generally don't need a new G10. Mm -hmm. However, if your bottle becoming smaller means you need to put less serum inside, then you would need a new G10 because the customer is getting less than the original product. Okay, so if you're still getting the same amount of product, but the overall, I guess, footprint of the packaging is changing up to 20%. Up to 20% is good. the general guideline. Yep. You're good. Okay, no, that makes sense. Now, if your packaging is getting 20% smaller, when you send that new shipment to Amazon, make sure you ask them to do a bin check and remeasure your product because you might save a little something on fees. Yep. Kind of how that relates. That's <laughs> interesting. I would think you did, but okay, no, that makes sense. No, and this one came up a lot in the last couple of years with supply chain disruptions. Yeah. You know, people had to switch suppliers a lot for mm -hmm. packaging and switch materials. So this one, we've been doing a lot. I could see that because everybody doesn't have the same exact, because they're essentially just white labeling a lot of stuff. Right. right. So it's like whatever packaging you already have available or bottles especially. Right. Right. So I could see that coming up a lot. Well, okay. That's a good one. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. Okay. Next, an apparel company gets B Corp certified and wants to put it on the package. Do they need a new G10? Mm, no. They do need really? a new G10. Yes. So this one is a little complicated mm -hmm. and certifications, there's so many different kinds of certifications, a little hard to paint with a broad brush. But I'm gonna give a food example because I think it's a little easier to understand why a certification requires a new G10 if you think about food. So think about if I'm getting my product certified gluten-free, I go through a laboratory process, You know, they do the, the testing and then I can put that certification on my package. Before I went through that process, my product might have been exactly the same, but I don't have any proof that it was, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Because mm -hmm. I wasn't testing. Yeah. For the because for the consumer who's looking for that certification, it is critical that they can differentiate the product that has received that certification. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Plus, our listings live on forever, so it's important to distinguish for on an online world product that has received that certification versus product that hasn't because every certification requires different things. You may have to store it differently or ship it slightly mm -hmm. differently. And so, yes, it does generally gonna require a new G10. What if it's the same product and you just got the certification after the fact? So let's say you were in the process of getting certification, you launched a product, you didn't have it yet, so you didn't talk about it yet, but then you switched to packaging. But that same product is certified. That's a really good question. If, you know, if the, I don't have an exact answer for you, honestly. So um, we may have to go to our standards team on that one. But I think if the product is the exact same and you had this intent to begin with, mm -hmm. um, you could probably account for that and you wouldn't need to add it. But again, let's check with the standards team. Okay. <laughs> let's go to yeah. the books. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that makes and sense. Part, this is part of the GS1 standards are voluntary, right? You mm -hmm. know, there is a certain amount of this is a judgment call. So I would ask people hmm. you know you want to call our member services team they can probably help you talk through an example like that i think it would depend on what it is too or if you have like remaining stock um like i'll give you a quick example like so we had a like a protein powder that we sold mm -hmm. and it was non-gmo mm -hmm. right was it non-gmo whatever it had a certification of some sort right and the initial shipment so we switched <laughs> We switched suppliers. Now, everything was really the same. There was some slight changes, but nobody could really tell in the labels just because they, they print them a little different. It's just how supplements are in general, right? If you guys really pay attention to supplement bottles, they're all basically the same for the specific sizes. It's just a bunch of different manufacturers uh, when they're made here in the U.S. So what ended up happening was the second one actually got the non-GMO on it, and then we updated the images because we wanted it to be factual. We didn't run out of the inventory, so we technically had cross-contamination of the stock somebody happened to notice that. And it was mm -hmm. like on the back, really small. Right. Because when you do like supplements, you need to show all sides on Amazon, right? Yeah. 
I don't know if they just wanted a free one because that happens. <laughs> I don't have to tell you guys, right? So they're just looking for it, like an angle to come at us with it. But that was actually a huge problem because not only did that happen, but we refunded them just to make them happy. But this person was out for blood. Mm -hmm. So they reported it to Amazon and the whole listing got suspended. Mm, it tricky. got fixed after we provided all the documentation, but that's very expensive. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, when you're selling, I mean, even if you're just selling maybe $200 a day in product, if you're down for a couple of weeks, I mean, that adds up or for a simple, simple thing like that. Absolutely. And, you know? and potentially lost customer loyalty and things like that as well. If, if someone is no longer comfortable yes. with your listing because they saw a, a bad yeah. review or something yeah. like that. And, well. and guys, it's not like you lose the listing, right? Say you want to do this, right? You essentially could just, I mean, you get a new UPC and you can add it as a variation, right? So you could keep selling the old product and you just add it as a variation. And if you do it right, you don't lose any of the reviews on that listing. So you know, get that thinking out of your head. You're not going to lose those reviews as long as it was set up appropriately from the get go. I mean, this is why we're, um, you know, we've been meeting with GS1 with so much lately uh, and even in the past is because this stuff is so important. You know, more of you guys are trademarking. Trademarking is easier than ever now. Um, it's not the way it was a couple years ago. Everybody's doing it now. And it's just silly not to follow through to do this properly. Now, if you have it set up as a brand properly on Amazon, you could simply just add it as a variation. Now, if you're out there doing stuff that yahoo's do and you're just going to do whatever you're going to do right um then it's less possible to do this but if you set up the listing properly from the get-go then just adding another you make another barcode and you just add it and you you know it shares the reviews you retain all the reviews so just keep that in mind of why this is important um we just recently did a video about scaling a brand to 30 grand in like a month just by you know doing variations um, this is the reason why we were able to do that is because everything was set up perfect and we just kept sharing those reviews. So just keep that in mind and we'll link that video down below as well. Well, I had another question that I wanted to ask you and I think this might be the, the moment to sort of bring it up, which is about changing your manufacturer with mm -hmm. the supplement specifically. So our guidance there in terms of whether or not I need a new G10 if I'm just changing my manufacturer, it's actually maybe <laughs> and tread carefully as you're saying, Patrick. So I think a lot of us, if you've ever gone through the uh, the process of switching manufacturers mm -hmm. on any product, you know it's complicated. So while it may seem pretty straightforward, you just send the new manufacturer the exact specs and they can recreate, recreate it exactly. It doesn't always go that way. They may not have access to exactly the same materials or the same markets to, to purchase uh, raw materials as well. And so generally it sort of seems like something where you may not need a new GT and you do the exact same thing. And as you go through the process, larger changes that you didn't expect come up. Yep. So something to keep in mind as you're considering whether you not whether or not you want to change your manufacturer. Pay attention to it because like the, even if you do it right, little things can get you right. So like I'll tell you what we did. Right. So basically we checked the um, not only was it because the contents can be shifted, especially in those like big supplement things, you could just have more or less. But even the overall size was exactly the same of the container it was in, not just a product. And another thing we checked was to make sure that they could do the same case pack quantities. Mm, yes. And it was all good. So we're like, all right, we'll, we'll do it, right? Yeah. Just, and it's what it is <laughs> at this point. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, so, you know, we went through that normal checklist of, you know, is 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 the weight changing? Is the, is the contents changing? Is yeah. the formula changing? Um, is how it's packaged changing? Because that matters a lot. Because right. now you're going in and you're changing the case pack in Amazon. Right. I like to keep it clean. So in that case, if I'm changing the case pack, I'll make a new one, mm -hmm. right? Some clients don't want to spend money on new UPCs, but we, we push them, right? Because a lot of people maybe just get three. Mm -hmm. And then when it's time to get more, they have to spend. I know this happened to me recently. I got busted by Amazon, guys. I did something I wasn't supposed to. And I burnt two UPCs, two. So I had to go back and buy them again like a pleb. I to buy <laughs> two at a time. <laughs> but I did it at the end of the day. But it's like why you have to pay attention when you're making the listing. Absolutely. And if you're prone to these things, maybe go for the prefix. <laughs> so you have a little more breathing room. Yeah, it was like, a, you know, it's, it, it was actually for our uh, our in-house brand that we're doing as a case study. So like, I didn't go crazy with it, buying, like getting like a yes. million different UPCs. But I was like, man, this this really had to happen. But it was a good example for it to happen um, where I didn't follow my own rules, which you get, you know how it is, right? You get overconfident and it is it is not a toy. And the product is, it's it's art. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an artboard at the end of the day. It's a puzzle, mm -hmm. right? for adults, mm -hmm. okay? It's not for kids, that's the key here. And they flagged it as a kid's toy and then they asked me for all these certifications. I'm like, the these CPSC, are, I don't know. Yep. This thing's handmade in Philadelphia. Like there's like this art studio we work with, we work with in Philadelphia that like cuts them. Like mm -hmm. they're made on a laser on a laser cutter. Like even the packaging is laser cut, which is pretty cool, right? We don't have those certifications and they're not toy, but it's, 
I'm an expert, right? And it got me too, which is perfect. But we're admitting it here, guys. Okay, it happened. <laughs> it happened. Okay, even if somebody got mad, it's like, oh man, my UPC got burned. Can I do anything about it? You can't because Amazon has it. it they, they, already, they already flagged it or they've already categorized it as a toy. So once that's done, it's done. You can't do anything about it. Right. Which is interesting. Interesting. Like I thought about it. I was like, can I call them and see? Let me call Megan. Maybe I can get... <laughs> I'm like, no, no, I can't. They already flagged it on Amazon. There's no sense. Right. Yeah. So I, we were discussing before we got started here, I attended Prosper show earlier this year. Yes. And Amazon was there talking about a new program they have called Ships in Product Packaging. Yes. So if I want to take advantage of that program, do you think I need a new GTIN to do that? That's a good question. That was actually something I was going to ask you because in most cases, the size is going to stay the same. Why wouldn't it, right? Like it's going to stay, I see them just making something more robust. The weight might change, but really by how much? Right. That's the question. So, the, you know, the short answer is probably not. Really, the goal here is to use your existing product packaging mm -hmm. and, and be able to ship within that to reduce waste. Now, we would preface that by saying if you have a big change, if Amazon tells you you need a new one, you need a new one. Mm -hmm. But it, for the most part, I think the goal here is to have people actually ship in the existing packaging with maybe some minor modifications to make it a little bit stronger. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Because I mean, realistically, you're going to add maybe, I mean, depending on how big the package is, I mean, you're essentially doing like a double, a double wall box as opposed to like the really thin one. So I could, I could see that changing. The only thing that I could see it changing is, so for example, some people, I mean, a lot of products out there, they're like, kind of like optimized for Amazon. Mm -hmm. So factories have been shipping Mm -hmm. Certain pro like you're not the first one to do what you think you're doing. Trust me, right? <laughs> so the case pack is really optimized for Amazon, and it's like that 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 Goldilocks size that everything needs to be like the box size. And if you add that little bit to it, um, like I give you an example, we're doing a product right now. We didn't launch it yet, but we're looking at it. That the size is 12 by 12 by six, and we're trying to pack everything in case packs of 24 by 20. So we got into the really into the weeds of the internal box size versus the external box size. Like, mm -hmm. I'm a psychopath. I want to make sure that we're sending it, like, especially now with the shipping changes happening in Amazon, you need to be particular. But now if I make that internal box just slightly bigger, the case pack might change. So now if the case pack changes, what would you say? I may, again, have to pull in my standards team on this one, but you could be in a situation where you're fine, you know, mm -hmm. per that original example with the cookies mm -hmm. <laughs> where you're okay with your product UBC, but you may need an updated case pack UBC, which is that 14 digit G10. Okay. Okay. So. That would make sense. Okay, guys. Yeah. Uh, we recently did something on this as well, and we'll link that down below, just kind of explaining the program. I think it's a good program. Um, there's some savings there to be had. And honestly, some of you guys don't even realize what's happening here. A lot of times Amazon's actually, if it's like a medium-sized product, they're probably shipping it in the box anyway, the original box, uh, and you don't even know about it. So, uh, or maybe you do, because when you see the returns and they come back, how trash they are. Also keep in mind, keep this in mind, um, nothing stops the customer from just throwing the return label on the original packaging and sending it back to you, or sending it back to Amazon. Um, and you could tell that that happened if when you get your original packaging back, if you could see that Amazon uses a special blade to cut the label off, the return label, so you can't see the customer's information, that's probably happening anyway. So doing this isn't a bad idea at all, at all. Good to know. Okay. A video game controller company mm -hmm. wants to create a special bundle with a set of headphones. Uh, they want to package them together. What do you think? Do you need a new G10 for that bundle? Ooh, you're not gonna like my answer. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, you, so Amazon has a program for this, right? So they have a, Amazon has a virtual bundling program. You wear this? They have, well, they have quite a few bundling programs. I, I know a little bit about some of them, but for sure I'm, so <laughs> I'm if, interested to hear your. Okay, so I'll answer your question first. So if you are physically bundling to, them together, they should have a new G10 because now you're physically changing everything. It's a completely different product, right? So you have to. Now, if you have product A and product B that you eventually want to physically bundle together and you're brand registered, in order to be brand registered, you need all the stuff we just talked about, right? You need to do this right. You can use Amazon's virtual bundling program. So you could virtually bundle it with Amazon and you don't need a new G10. Now you technically get a new Amazon ASIN, but that's that's irrelevant at this point, right? So you could do it that way if you wanted to. So that's what we recommend. Say you have these two individual products, try bundling them first together to see if people are interested in, in the product as a bundle. And then if that's the case, you're gonna save money anyway 
bundling them yourself. Because what happens is a virtual bundle, which no one's telling you, is you're paying the individual fees for each item. So Amazon loves this too. You'll like it because you're, you know, you're, you're increasing your, your dollar per sale, but you're paying the fee twice. That's what people don't realize. So you start as a virtual bundle, but then eventually make a real bundle, right? And just mm-hmm. the savings alone is worth that G10, without a doubt. Well, I love that answer. Thank you. That, <laughs> yeah, that's, I, that was a complicated one. It's like, well, absolutely. you do this and then you do that. Absolutely. Bundling on Amazon is a big topic. So yes, as you said, if you're going to put the two together in a box, which could be a good long-term strategy for you, that would require new Jitin. It's essentially you know, a package set, but there's a lot of other ways you can do bundling on Amazon and I agree with you that uh, there's different ways to do it in each. And there's plenty of information about how, you know, w- whether a particular situation would require a new Jitin out there. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I, I mean, great. for me, like rule of thumb, if you're bundling two things, absolutely, you need a new one. You know, yes. Two different products. Okay, so here's one that is where it comes up a lot, Amazon community. I've acquired a new brand. I'm going to bring them into my company. They're going to be under my legal name now. Do mm-hmm. I need to reassign them GTINs, new GTINs? Hmm. I don't know. I really don't know. Are they able to transfer? Yes. They are able to transfer. Yes. So this comes up a lot. I feel like on Amazon, everyone yeah. either wants to be acquired or they're acquiring yeah, new brands. It's, you a very, this every day. it's a hot topic. So, every day. yes, fortunately, you don't need to acquire uh, any new GTINs until you're ready to make new product under that new brand. Mm-hmm. GS1 has a process by which you can transfer the ownership of entire company prefixes from one company to another. At GS1 US, it's basically a form and there's a letter of attestation. It's pretty mm-hmm. simple. And it'll just show up now under the new legal owner of that of that new brand. And until hmm. you, unless you change the product, it will start discussing any of these other topics yeah. with that product, uh, you won't need to assign new GTINs. You can maintain your listing and your. So then they have the there. rights to the brand name when mm-hmm. they're doing that. So then when they assign new GTINs, it'd be fine because then they could just select their brand when they create the new ones, right? Right. Or if. If they've acquired a company that say has a 10 capacity prefix but mm-hmm. has only used three of those yeah. GTINs, the new the new owner will have the seven GTINs mm-hmm. that they can use. Okay, that's cool. That's mm-hmm. good to know. So you could transfer that as well when you guys sell all these brands. That that's like the topic. I mean, it's crazy how many people are trying, right? Absolutely. Uh, we see people trying to sell too early, mm, way way too early. You know, or it's like, or they'll, they'll want way too much because they mm-hmm. they watch they watch something on TV or something. They're like, oh, you need to pay me 10x this. It's like, no, I don't. <laughs> well, I think one thing that is really important is to get your ducks in a row early. Many of the things you're talking yeah. about, do it right the first time. Nobody is going to want to acquire your brand if you know you, you haven't done it properly. Yeah. Because that's the only way to scale it, is to have everything done according to the rules. You will never see someone buy your generic brand on Amazon. Hot take or not, it's not going to happen, right? And if they do, they're, they're misinformed because that's, that's a really bad thing. There's zero protection. So anything you've built up on that platform, Guys, remember, like all the work you're putting in, and r- realistically, your, your listing is your, your your livelihood at the end of the day on Amazon. All the work and all the effort that you put into it, uh, good or bad, right? So sometimes that's why people get upset when they get a lot of bad reviews because you put so much into it, right? right? But if it's not set up right, no one's going to, if that's your goal is to eventually sell it, no one's going to take you seriously in the slightest because honestly, and this is a hot take, it's worthless as a generic, if it's set up as a generic listing, it's worthless because I promise you, I'll do it. I could jump on your listing and you do nothing about it. What are you going to do about it, right? You might try to report it, right? But it then we have that conversation. We have to say, you need to now physically prove that that item is actually different. And what if I just go to your supplier and get that same exact item? So this is how you have to think. You have to think that someone's going to be evil towards you, right? That's how you have to think. And, and you need to put a moat around your business and just doing some administrative work. That's what this is at the end of the day. Absolutely. Right. Just doing the right stuff like ensures that you're you have that mode around your business. Absolutely. The same way you get insurance for your business, yeah. license it, get a website. You know, one of the things about transferring G10 ownership is we get a lot of people who maybe acquired a brand years ago and they just didn't know how to do the process. And mm-hmm. now years have gone by and it's a lot more complicated. So good thing to be aware. This is possible. It's really straightforward and easy. Please come to us early in the process. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Maybe even before you actually acquire the brand, right? To make sure everything is all in the up and up, that might be a good check. Absolutely. You know, to do that. They might just tell you, yeah, we have real UPCs and then you go check later and it's, I mean, people lie, right? So it's just a good way to check everything and, and, and have all your ducks in a row. And often I think people don't even know that they did something wrong, mm-hmm. um, especially if they sort of started a, a business on the side and it took off. They may not have done anything wrong on purpose. Uh, but you can always ask for that GS1 certificate yes. if you want to be absolutely sure that they have GS1 GTINs. There's plenty of people with um, 
brand registered brands that stuff was set up years ago and it's not correct. And there's a whole process that they don't want to deal with now because they're scared mm -hmm. of what could potentially happen. So, um, you know, you don't want to be in that situation because then you're always worried that something could happen. Absolutely. Right. Which you shouldn't have to. Absolutely. You want to be able to scale seamlessly. Mm hmm. Correct. So, I mean, at the end of the day, like, like we were saying, a lot of this stuff is administrative, right? But it's super important. And maybe people don't think past that, right? It's like something they might just skip. What are the consequences if they don't get this right? Yeah, and we talked, we touched on a lot of these throughout our conversation, Patrick. So the first one is you could lose face with some of your retailers, mm -hmm. which could be really important depending on your growth strategy. Number one, if you've changed certain key attributes, but you haven't changed the GTIN, you might not even be able to set up a new shipment in their system. Mm -hmm. You may get kicked out right away. Or maybe you can, and then it arrives there and uh, you've burned a pretty important bridge because they're really unhappy. Maybe your product is different enough that they're, it won't fit on their shelves anymore, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, and that could cause you really, that could cause you issues over your long-term growth, to be honest, could be pretty important. How's this relevant to Amazon? I'll tell you how this is relevant to Amazon, guys. Let's just say that you change the size significantly and you send it in for whatever reason. Um, I wouldn't put it past Amazon to backdate all your fees for like the last six months. So think about what would happen there if they decided to raise your fee for the size. And I'm saying this for a reason, because this has happened. I wouldn't put it past them to just backdate everything you've sold the last six months and just up the fee on every single item. That would be soul crushing. That'd be crazy. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The second thing to think about is your own internal systems, right? Your management. The G10 is a very powerful tool because you can unique, uniquely identify a product. It can combine your sales data, your inventory, multiple warehouses, multiple trading partners, multiple retailers. If you start throwing variables into what that G10 means, that can really cause problems in your own systems. Something to think about, especially if you're pushing towards further growth and you're thinking global. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't want to not know what product in, is in a particular location. You need to understand what's there. So that's that's another thing. Um, third, we've definitely talked about this. You could lose customers and you could lose cash. <laughs> yeah. On Amazon, you know, I personally, I was shopping for a puzzle on Amazon the other day and there was... A... Was it you? Did you leave the... No, it, was you? <laughs> it wasn't. You're the Megan. Come on. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> and it wasn't your product. It was, it was definitely a kid's product. So, but I was, I was shopping for a gift and the... The puzzle was listed as a 256 piece puzzle and it only had 176 pieces in it, I think. And the only review was from a customer who showed a picture of the box and said, it's not the same puzzle, right? Did I buy it? No, <laughs> right? Because it was priced mm -hmm. for what I thought was a 256 puzzle piece puzzle and it wasn't. Uh, and those are the kinds of things that happen if you're changing up the product and not reflecting that in the identifier as well. And you could have to replace product, as we mentioned, I think, on the dog food example. You could have to send that customer new product. And mm -hmm. so now you've given them two products for the price of one and maybe not guarantee their loyalty at that anyway. See, not everybody is great as you. So what a lot of people would do on Amazon is they'd actually buy it and then be ready to complain the second that it showed up. And then what, you know, kind individual like myself would do is just refund them the, the actual cost of the product. And we give away a lot of stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? Just, but the goal is to not do that so you don't put yourself right. in that situation. You know, right. wow. So they were, I wonder if it was, they changed it or they probably changed it and then just never went back and, and redid it or because it's actually in the listing. I mean, the even worse thing that could have happened was you could have actually physically gotten it and it was actually different. Right. Internally different. Well, and that's what happened to the first yeah. first person who left that review. Yeah. And only by reading the reviews was I what was I aware. So they just never <laughs> so updated I didn't buy it. it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Not sure. And I think, you know, when you're talking about a, a puzzle or a one-off commodity, that's one thing. But when you're trying to build loyalty, supplements, skincare, yeah. pet food, mm -hmm. those those are brands you're really trying to get people to buy repeatedly. And you could burn a really serious bridge with your customer who might come back and be a repeat customer, but they don't trust you anymore. Yes, especially for stuff like that, right? So food, any, anything to do with pets, anything. People, <laughs> they care about their pets more than their children. I'm telling you, like people ask me sometimes, like what are the, which one's like the, mo the craziest category, right? Now, I don't like the baby category in general because of liability. Pets is similar, but pets doesn't have the same, I guess, liability legally. But it, people are pickier about pet items than they are about baby items from what I've seen. Interesting. Wild. Interesting. Wild. They like the dog more than the kid, which is crazy to me. <laughs> but, or cat or whatever they have. It's, it's just nuts. But yeah, so you have to be careful. It has to be right. It has to be exact. 
Um, not everybody is kind as you. Some people would buy it and then do what you know what what, what she did, right? But even in, in in fairness, right? They just they didn't show it right. You right. know what I mean? So who who knows? Maybe it was being nefarious, or maybe they just made a mistake. Right. You know. Right. But yeah, careful out there, guys. And you know, we just want to say at GS One US, we really believe in the ability for all businesses, all brands to grow, go global, whatever the future holds for them, we believe in their ability to do that. And these are the kinds of small things you don't want to trip you up on that long-term growth strategy. Mm -hmm. Using a G10 for the wrong product, why bother? It's silly. Yeah, It's such a silly mistake. Guys, there's so many other mistakes that you can make. They're fun mistakes too, right? This is just a silly mistake to make. Absolutely. You know, it's just like, it's like I always say, like when it comes to even like where you can get in trouble in like Amazon Seller Central, right? The worst thing to get any kind of uh, like ding on your account is to not answer a customer inquiry on time. To me, that's the silliest possible thing. And I see that all the time. This is similar to that, right? It's something you need to do anyway. Um, it's something you need to do if you take your brand seriously. And yet people like they, they cut corners here. And it's just silly to do that if they're trying to grow long term. Absolutely. And there's lots of resources available. You know, we mentioned we do have this decision tool that people can take a look at. We also have an amazing member services team. So if you're not sure, call and ask for help. And GS1US will do its very best to ensure you have good information to make the right decision. You guys actually pick up the phone. We do. You do. I know. You're making a, a, a UPC video. <laughs> we do. And uh, I ended up calling you, but <laughs> <laughs> then it wasn't completely in your department. So then I actually had to call GS1. Right, because I was in a rush, guys. I'm not that. I'm not this way. Okay, I'm not some elitist. Or I'm like, I'm just gonna call her. No, we were making a video for you, so I needed the answer right away because we had other stuff to do during the day. And I went ahead and called, and I got my answer, and it was explained to me just fine. And I and it was actually something really silly I did, and they were really good about it. Like, wasn't condescending. I, I, I call the member nothing. services team too. Yeah, yeah <laughs> if like I just asks don't me know. A question, I don't know. I just call them. They pick up usually less than a minute. So yeah, it's very I, easy. I, I felt so silly after once I realized what it was. I was like, okay, and they gave me the answer, and then we resolved it within like ten minutes, which is pretty cool. I mean, you you can't do that. Not a lot of companies offer that, so I, I appreciate that you guys put that out there. Absolutely. You guys have no excuses. You have like zero excuses. Absolutely. Okay. So I have a couple of questions for you, and these questions came from where they came from. Uh, some of you guys asked these questions, but unfortunately, we're not going to go through them all because I'm here and you're not. So I get to choose the questions that we actually asked Megan. She hasn't even seen these yet. I um, mean, you guys weren't too bad on her. So let's see here. <laughs> okay, so the first one: Can I list a product on Amazon without a UPC? I mean. I think the answer is mostly not. Uh, there are a few exceptions. You can sometimes get a UP, uh, UPC exemption. And there are some product categories that have a lot of uh, personalization, some mm -hmm. jewelry and things where you wouldn't need a UPC. But for the most part at this point, a UPC is going to be required. Books, you're good, because that's ISBN. Yeah, that's ISBN. completely different, right? <laughs> but it's still a unique identifier. So this one's actually a funny question. So someone asked, where can you buy UPC codes online? Right? And I, I thought like this was pretty common knowledge. Right. So it's like, where do you buy UPC codes online? Do I have UPC for my Amazon? Do I need a UPC for my Amazon business? I'm actually surprised that this is a question that came out. I mean, it's considering even all the content that we put out regarding this. So where can they actually buy the UPCs? Yes. And I'm really excited to answer this question because we have a pretty big update on this one, actually. So uh, you can always come to gs1us.org and you can purchase either single GTINs, which are one-time fee, $30, or you can get a company prefix. If you're growth-oriented or have a lot of products, we definitely recommend the company prefix because there's a lot more you can do with it other than GTINs, and your cost per GTIN is going to go down significantly. As far as where to get it, we have some pretty big changes in the works. Um, so you can come to our website. There are now going to be a few select partners that will be able to uh, via API, connect directly with our database and license that way. So you may start to see that as well. If you're not sure if someone who is claiming to offer UPCs actually is getting them through that API to G from GS1 US, you'll be able to come to our website and uh, look it up. It's called the Channel Partner Program. You'll be able to see who is actually allowed to do that within that program, in case you're not sure. It's a great program. We might have an update about that soon as well. Yeah. I have to say, like the, the website has changed quite a bit, like over yes. the last couple of years. So I know you guys have been taking feedback. I don't know if it's been like at these big conferences. I know you guys have taken our feedback, which I'm shocked, <laughs> right? So like we had calls and we did some things, and and you guys made changes, which is pretty cool. Uh, so I, I really do appreciate that you guys making those changes. Um, everybody else out there is trying to make it more complicated, 
for people and you guys are trying to simplify. So we really appreciate that as a community in general, as, as an Amazon community in general. I think it would have been harder to make it more complicated. <laughs> so nice, yeah, uh, nice. yeah I, I you know really appreciate that feedback, Patrick, because our digital team, they work so hard. They have done an amazing job to try to really take that standards information and make it digestible and make it accessible. There are some people that just, they need a, a UBC, that's it. They don't need any. They don't need any more information. They don't need any more education. They want to be able to get in and get mm -hmm. out. And we're trying to make sure that they can do that, while still providing that growth information that different kinds of companies need, and the supply chain information and the pharmaceutical information gets mm -hmm. really complicated. But we're definitely it's it's a big priority for us to make sure that it's easy for people to understand when they come to our website what they need, what that path is for them, and what next steps they should take. I think you're at an advantage with the Amazon community because a lot of people are coming from trademarking, right? So those of you that did come from there, you know what I mean. So the way I gauge a bad website is if it has that government feel, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the USPTO website um, cannot have more of a government feel than it does. It's super complicated. So they finish there, they get they get their trademark or at least their, uh, their serial number for their trademark and they're now on your website, you guys have a huge advantage. Yes. So much better <laughs> compared to that. I mean, it's craziness. Yes, and we're, new updates are coming all the time. Cool, so. looking forward to it. All right, we have one more for you. Last question. What codes UPC ASIN do I need on the packaging for Amazon Canada? Oh, so this is a really good question. One thing to keep in mind is that GS1 standards are global, which means they are uh, they are interoperable across global markets. So generally, you can use the same UPC across border. However, there's some other things you need to think about when, when considering whether you need a unique UPC, which would be, do I need to change my packaging? for like linguistic reasons, uh, for regulatory reasons, you know, there may be different recycling uh, markers for, you know, EU, that's a, that's a big mm -hmm. one in the EU right now. You, yep. have to, you have to have different recycling markers on your packaging depending on the market. Um, or it might need to be made of your, a slightly different material to fit in with local regulations. So while we say generally it's gonna be a global standard, there are other specifics you may have to think about to determine whether you need to change your product enough to comply in that okay. marketplace. Okay. That's as far as GS1 goes. Uh, let's say with just directly with Amazon, guys, if you guys are selling in the US market, right? So if you're selling on Amazon.com, you also have the capability of selling on Amazon Mexico as well as Amazon Canada. And Amazon will take care of that. They actually flag products on their own if there's a potential issue. Now, you also can go global, which is a bit more complex, but you can also do it through there. So technically, if you went through there, Amazon doesn't require it, uh, but they still kind of put it back on you, right? But technically they'll do some checks and if there is a problem, it's kind of it's kind of on them. So that's kind of how I have to look at it. But something as simple as Canada, um, if you're selling an Amazon on Amazon.com and you want to also show up in Canada and Mexico, in most cases you could just click a button and you'll you'll be on those websites as well. Okay, Megan, well, I really appreciate you stopping by. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you and uh, maybe I'll see you around in uh, any upcoming events that you guys are going to. Uh, well, we have our own conference, GS1 Connect, coming up in June. So that'll be my next travel. That's where a lot of our members come and learn about the updates in the standard and share some of the really innovative things that they're doing. Going to be a lot of talks about 2D barcodes this year. Mm -hmm. So keep an eye on that if you're uh, if you're interested. 2D barcodes are really going to change the way a lot of business is done. It's going to be really exciting. So that's my next big, uh, big jaunt. Awesome. Sounds good. Looking forward to seeing you there. Um, guys, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, uh, start the conversation down below. If you guys like this video, you'll really love this one.